quick um, just an outline of what I hope to talk about over the next 50 minutes or so. Um, first, briefly, what is extensive reading? Um, I guess many of you know the answer to this, so I'm going to keep that fairly brief. Uh, next is how to get books. Uh, next, where to put them. And then how to get ebooks. Uh, so um, for extensive reading, I um, there are many, I could uh, talk about what is extensive reading for probably the whole weekend, um, but I'm going to try and keep this to a couple of minutes. And I'm just going to look at, um, this is Sakai Sensei's rules for extensive reading, which I think is the best place to start if you're trying to explain extensive reading to your students. And he has three rules. Um, which are no dictionaries. Um, if you don't know a word, ignore it. And if it's boring, give up. Um, and the obviously the reason for no dictionaries um, is, um, well, dictionaries, for, for one thing, dictionaries um, are kind of um, very frustrating. So we may find if we're trying to read something, we come to a word we don't know, we try to find our dictionary. We have to remember where our dictionary is. We look in the dictionary, try to find the word. When eventually we find the word in the dictionary, there may be another word in the definition and we don't know what that means either. So we start to get very frustrated. So um, dictionaries um, tend to make us frustrated. And also we may find the next day we're reading again, we come to a word, we think, oh, I don't know this word. I wonder what it means. We look in the dictionary and then realize it's the same word we looked at yesterday. Um, so they, they drive us crazy. They don't really help. Um, they're good in, um, dictionaries are kind of, um, dictionaries are, are tools and they're very, very useful tools for language learners. But a dictionary is a bit like a hammer and hammers are very good for some things. If you wanna fix your TV, don't use a hammer. So the same thing for dictionaries with extensive reading. They don't really help. Um, and it's important to try and get books that have easy words. Um, and so um, this is just to put that into numbers. Um, you should be able to read for extensive reading. You should have at least 98% of the words on any page. Um, you should know what they are in order for extensive reading to be successful and effective. Um, and the I guess the reason one reason for this is um, extensive reading is more about fluency. People often think, well, oh, they're, they're reading. If we're reading these easy books, then how are we going to learn anything? How will we learn any any new words? Um, but it's more um, it's kind of I look at it kind of like jogging, that extensive reading is a way to become more fluent, to read more quickly, to read more smoothly and to be more comfortable um, with English. So that's that's some Sakai Sensei's first rule. Uh, no dictionaries. Um, the second rule then is if you don't know a word, um, people often focus on what they don't know when they're reading, and um, which is why they end up looking in dictionaries. But if you don't know a word, then you can just ignore it and try and keep reading. Um, and if you're trying to, if you are trying to learn vocabulary, um, you need at least eight to 20 times that you need to see the word often in different situations, maybe with different, next to different words. Um, and the first few times you see a word, uh, you can leave it to your subconscious. Uh, your subconscious will recognize the word, will notice the word. Um, and after a while, after many more times, you will start to pick up those words. Um, the next thing then, um, if it's boring, give up. This, does, this doesn't mean give up extensive reading. Um, <laughs> This just means give up the book that you're trying to read. Um, and uh, life is short. Oh, I have, uh, I've just got some help from Yod. Anyway, the, the point, the important point is um, don't try. That trying does not make people better at language. Babies don't try and all babies can speak their language. Yeah, good, good, good. So, um, so how much then um, extensive reading, um, Another thing about extensive reading, just very simply, extensive means a lot. And um, how much is a lot? Uh, this is a difficult question. Sometimes you know, oh, I did extensive reading with my students. Uh, we read one book last year. 
and that's not really extensive reading. Um, you need something like um, 100,000 words in order to get out of the habit of translating as you read. It's very natural. Uh, there are lots of things as teachers that we find very annoying that our students do. Most of the things that our students doing are doing are completely natural and completely sensible. And if, they, if you're trying to read a foreign language that you don't know and that you're not fluent in, then it's very natural to translate it into your language. Um, and it's also very unhelpful. But to stop, to break that habit, you need to, you need to read something like 100,000 words, um, which is a lot for students who may only have read something like 30,000 words in the six years that they've been at school. Um, 300,000 words then is another kind of milestone. And um, this is um, how much you need to read to show improvements in language tests, just from the reading. Um, if you read, if you have um, a TOEIC test and you want to read, reading will improve your TOEIC score, but not if you've got a test next week. If you have a test next week, reading will probably be a waste of time. Um, it may help you relax. Um, but if you've got a TOEIC test next week, practice some TOEIC questions. If you have a TOEIC test next year, then reading um, will help. Um, so these are, and then a million words is, um, is how much um, Hitoshi Nishizawa suggests you need to read to be able to select appropriate books independently. Until then, he would recommend that students need to be told, read this, read this. And this is, this is um, probably a good idea. It's against one of the ideas of extensive reading, which is that students choose their own books, uh, which I'll try to come to later. Um, so in terms of these numbers, 100,000 words, I think, is a reasonable target for one semester in a university course. And I think 300,000 is a reasonable amount for students to read in one year. Um, so this may seem like a lot, um, but it's it's not it's not impossible. It's a reasonable amount to expect. Um, so the most important thing then that we need for extensive reading is books, and um, books. Um, just let me just talk about our own extensive reading program. I teach in Shinshi University, which is a national university in Matsumoto in Nagano. Um, we have gone through about um, over 10 years of an extensive reading program. Um, first of all, getting books, and you need books. Without books, um, there's no extensive reading. We started off with books in the classroom. We then got books into the library, um, and now we're trying to get books online. Um, there are three problems, really, with books. Um, first of all is where do you get the money to buy them? Uh, next is which books do you get? And then is then where do you put them? Um, so uh, part one of our story, um, we had no books and no money and no library. Or we did have a library, but we didn't realize we had a library at first. Um, and so what we started off doing was we got our students to buy books. Each student would buy one book we would then build up a kind of class library. They would put the book they'd finished into the class library and then borrow another book. Um, and this was quite effective. Um, we, our program started with just two of us teaching and then we had a few more teachers and then it built up and then it, uh, then it became part of the curriculum. So we had um, dozens of teachers and dozens of classes all doing extensive reading. Um, the, the good things about getting students to buy books, um, it kind of puts the choice with the students so they get a sense of ownership, their stockholders, their shareholders in the library, they are their books. Um, and this also works with a kind of learner centered approach to language teaching, which also ties into the idea that the students, well, you're responsible for your English as well now that you're a university student so this kind of tied in um, and students find a graded reader is cheaper than a textbook so the students are quite happy to buy a cheaper book uh, we got them to donate their books at the end of the year and we kind of had an opt 
an opt out rather than opt in. So we assumed that they would donate their books. If they wanted their books back, uh, they had to come to a classroom at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning on the fifth floor. So they could they could get their books back if they wanted to, but they were kind of encouraged to, to be generous. And they were kind of quite happy to be generous. Um, there are the, the another advantage with um, having classroom books is that you can kind of socialize reading. Reading tends to be a solitary activity. And as language teachers, we often want people to be social. And having books in the classroom is great for this. Um, we kind of managed, got the students to class library manage. So Yoda, Yoda wrote that one again. Um, students can browse through books with their friends and decide what they what they want to borrow and hey, have you read this? They can also swap books in the class very easily if you have class readers. Uh, not so easy with library books. Uh, I think and activities like putting the books into genre or, or organizing them. Um, in terms of um, cultural attitudes, Japan is a very rich in print culture. Japan has a very, um, a lot of books, a lot of people read, reading is very natural, reading is a very normal activity. Um, this means um, that printed matter sometimes is taken for granted and um, students are very, very happy to donate their books to us or give their books to their friends or leave their books in their room or throw their books in the bin. Um, so we found that this system um, was good in some ways, um, but we also had a lot of trouble keeping track of books. Uh, we made customized borrowing sheets, we had color coding, had the students responsible for paperwork and policing, and we lost hundreds of books, possibly thousands of books. Um, these were books that the students had donated, um, but they were also, they came and, and they went. So we also got some books from publishers. Uh, we got, we found some budget somewhere to buy some books. Um, so we found um, the library was the perfect place to keep books. And um, if you have a library in your institution, I would recommend um, try getting some books there. Uh, classrooms are not libraries. Um, many teachers are not really librarians. Teachers are much too nice. Um, if the library, libraries sometimes will not let you graduate if you don't return your library books. I heard of a library, I think in Estonia, where they would put people in prison if they didn't return their library books. Um, so teachers would never do that. Um, and library, but libraries and librarians are experts at keeping books and getting them back um, if people take them away. So um, the libraries is a, is a great place. Um, and the second phase of the story is um, working with the library. Um, now, the, in terms of money, um, the library regularly asks teaching staff what to buy. Uh, so they have, there are budgets within the library, there are budgets within departments, within faculties um, that are all set up for the library to buy books. Um, so it's, there is money there. The other thing that the library needs, I think our, our average, um, our average student in the university, I think maybe visited the library once a year, I think was the average usage rate of the library um, and the library to, to justify its existence it needs students to come um, and borrow books um, so we found that graded readers were an ideal solution for the library because we're telling our students to read one book or two books a week the students are going into the library every week borrowing books borrowing books regularly so we got the, these are some figures from a couple of years ago these are the top library lending the top books for the different faculties um, and of the top 10 books um, five of them are graded readers for these two faculties uh, for the education faculty the um of the top 10 books borrowed by education majors in the first year nine of them were graded readers um, so the their reading um a lot, a lot of the library borrowing is graded readers. And as far as their statistics, it, it doesn't matter whether they're 
what the books are. If they have, if they're lending many books, then um, it looks good for the library. So the library's um, kind of happy. Um, so just a bit more about books then. Um, this is a um, completely random set of numbers that I've put together to look like it's data. And uh, the, the graph, as you can see on the, the, um, the X axis is easy and difficult. So over here, we have the easy books. Over here, we have the difficult books. And this is boring and interesting books. Uh, this is this one over here is the, um, can you see the, the cursor? This is, um, this is a university entrance yeah, we see exam. That. That's fine. This is a university entrance exam or related a, a high school textbook related to university entrance. Um, so for a given student, um, they're going to be limited um, this way. A low level student is limited to these books that they can read and to um, these books that they want to read. Uh, so you, you need a lot of books since students have different levels and um, your students are all going to be different. So this may be an average student. Uh, for another student, um, this may be, there may be no books that they find interesting uh, below level six or seven. So if they're looking, if, they're, if their reading level is down here, then it's going to be very tough getting them to find a book that they're going to enjoy reading because they're not going to be able to read these books up here. Um, un uh, it's unlikely they'll be able to read the books up here. Um, there is, I believe, again, I have absolutely zero data for this, um, but I was starting to look for, for, um, for library borrowing data. And we, when we have, um, uh, extensive reading programs, we tend to see some books very, very often. There are some books that lots of students seem to read or that every student seems to have read. Um, and I suspect there's something like a 1090 or a 2080 relationship that the top books, and I'm sure Paul has some X reading data on this, the books that are borrowed most are borrowed many, many times more. And there are some books in libraries that nobody has ever borrowed. They've just sat there on the shelves collecting dust. Um, some of them, probably it's a good thing that they're collecting dust because they're not very good. Some of them are probably hidden gems that if people read them, they would actually enjoy them. Um, so again, you've got this, um, there's a small number of books. And if you don't have a big library, that 10%, given the level of students, that could just be one or two books. Uh, so it's it's very, very important to try to get a large library to get a, an access to a large number of books. Um, and I'm just going to go into um, part three now, which is um, on online, on ebooks. Um, so we've been actually we've been trying to get ebooks for a while. Um, and we have we have been getting ebooks into our library for a while. It's become particularly important this year, um, as you may have realised. It's been difficult for students to visit the library. It's been impossible to have reading in class. So in many ways, this year has been very very difficult uh, for extensive reading. Um, but as far as ebooks are concern, concerned, um, the libraries have also discovered ebooks. So it's possible that your library already has bought some ebooks, um, some English ebooks. Um, libraries, that's kind of the good news. Um, possibly the bad news is that libraries have websites and the library websites are not always ideal for extensive reading. Um, a couple of, well, I, I'll come to the, uh, I'll, come to, I'll come back to um, the problem for that, but first of all, um, when you are, when you're getting ebooks, ebooks are not the same as paper books. Um, there are different licenses. So some ebooks you can get for your library and you have the book permanently in the same way as if you borrowed a paper book. Uh, in fact, better because paper books start to fall to pieces after a few years. The ebooks presumably will still be there. Um, the ones and zeros may all blur into, but I, they should hopefully still be there. Uh, some 
ebooks are on a fixed term license. So some ebooks you have a license, you can read the book for one year or two years. There are also different um, some books. There's a limit. Some there's a limit to how many people can read a book at a time. If you have a physical book in your library, obviously only one person can read that book. If someone is borrowing it, um, it needs to come back before someone else can read it. The same then, or sometimes with ebooks, there may be a limit to how many people can read the book at the same time. It may just be one person. Um, it could be five people. Uh, some books it's possible to download so you can get around this by um, students can go in download the book and then nobody is reading the book in real time um, another issue when you're getting ebooks for the library is how the students access the books so are they getting the books through the library um, and by logging into the library's system or do they need to have a separate user ID and a separate password? Um, next is where to get uh, the ebook. So there's three places that I know of that we have been using. Um, one of them is Marizen, Marizen ebook library. Another is EBSCO, and another is called Libra, Library, Library, uh, li Library. Um, that's a that's a Japanese site. Uh, Marizen is Japanese. I think EBSCO is from the US. Um, so there are, there are challenges then with ebooks. Um, ebooks are more expensive than paper books when you buy them for libraries. Um, some substantially more expensive. This to me this this doesn't make sense to me as a as a as a consumer. Um, I suspect as a publisher it makes a lot of sense to make books for libraries, ebooks for libraries more expensive. Um, but so this is an issue with finding, um, you could buy um, five or six paper books, or you could buy maybe two or three ebooks. Um, the, they are often difficult for the students to find. So when the like, when the ebook, if, if the books, if you have a, a physical, graded reader library or a part of the library, it's usually very easy for the students to walk in, find where the, the graded readers are, and also find um, uh, the easy ones are on the left. They, they got pink stickers on and the more difficult ones have got red stickers or green stickers. Um, so they can very easily see where the books are and what level the books are and they can pick them up and say, oh, this looks quite thin. I can probably read this quickly. This is a thick book that's going to take more time. So there are things that, that help with real books that are a lot more difficult and challenging with, with um, e-books. Uh, another, just another, another bit of information about ISBN. Um, if you have a particular graded reader, there may be a different ISBN. There will be a different ISBN, often whether it's uh, there may be a, a UK published book that has a different ISBN for the Japanese publication. It could be exactly the same book. Uh, there may also be new editions. When a book comes out with a new cover, there's also a new ISBN. There are often different ISBNs. If the book has audio, there'll be a different ISBN for the book with audio or the book on paper. And there will be different ebook ISBNs and probably, possibly more than one ISBN for ebooks for that book, depending on, on the format of the ebook. Um, so this is our libraries, um, this is part of our library page. If you go to, um, I, find, I find our library's website incredibly difficult to navigate. And that may just be me. Um, it may just be because it's very difficult to navigate, but there is some um, Denshi book. So there are ebooks you can find. Um, and down here, there's some um, we can find. This is Ego Tadoku EBSCO books. We've got EBSCO audio books. Um, I was very excited when I saw early English books online, hoping this was books for people to read, young people to read, and people to read when they're starting to learn English. Um, it is, of course, um, early English language, so it's, it's Chaucer, 
and Piers Plowman and um, not ideal for our students to read, unfortunately. Um, going on, there is also down here is Marazen eBooks, which are also um, Tadoku, also extensive readers. Um, so we can go into within our library, um, if we're feeling brave, we can go into the EBSCO books. This will then, depending on whether we're on the campus within the university's, um, within the university's firewall, uh, some of this will automatically take you to the, the site. If you're outside, then you can select, you can try and find the university here is um, is listed in there. So we can then get to the, um, we have to decide which of these the ebooks might be in because it's no longer telling us ebooks. Um, but when we eventually find them, we can find um, if we haven't given up by that stage. Um, th so this is a great, I think this is a great, a, a great challenge with ebooks is making it easy for the students to get to the ebook without having to jump through several digital hoops. Uh, library Air um, is um, unfortunately, you need another, so this requires a, a new username and a new password, um, which we will need to set up for our students and when hopefully we have new students in April, we'll need to create a new set of passwords, somehow communicate these passwords to the students. Um, these books, uh, Oxford books are available on, on um, this site. And, and uh, but, and we have the, pe the covers, so it looks, it looks not bad. Um, there's no obvious, as far as graded readers are concerned, there's no obvious way of seeing what level these books are. So if a student is at a very low level, uh, they may start reading a very high level book by mistake. Um, we can, you can put stage one, if you know what you're doing, you can put stage one, for example, into the search, and this will then find um, the stage one books. So um, again, the, the this is, if once students have got the, username and the password and the right password and then work to how to search they can then hopefully find some books that they may be able to read um this is an, another thing that our university is i'm sorry just go back another thing that our university has done is it, it has a it has a page um about extensive reading so this is all written in japanese and they have their links down here to um opac which is an online I'm not sure what OPAC stands for. Maybe someone can write what OPAC stands for in the chat. Um, but it's the it's a it's an online database of what books are in the library, and they have also they so you can click on the different um, YL is Yomi Yasusa level, which is a, a, a one of the scales of difficulty of books. Um, if you if you go for YL one. Um, pink, then it will give you a list down here of all the books that are at this level. So this is actually quite um, quite helpful. Um, the library is using, there's a page. If you can find that page, you can then get into the, the books at the right level. Um, so we can we can use, if we have, we use Moodle as, a, as the LMS. So we can add a link to the university's Tadoka page that will help the students find the books that are there. So there are things, there are kind of workarounds that you can do. Um, you can, so to make it, make it, making things look nice, making things easy to find is, is important. So um, we're starting as well to try and use the, uh, Moodle has a glossary function, which we're trying to use to put lists of some of the books. Um, we now have um, the, the, the pro so the problem with them, um, one problem with this is there's no, this doesn't tell us which one is an ebook. So if our students are trying to find an ebook through the library, uh, this is going to tell them what's in the library, but they, they then need to go down and look at the books and find out on the, on the next page whether they're a library book and then get the link to Marazen or EBSCO, wherever the link is going. Um, so to make, make it nice, one thing that the library has found is a site called Booklog which um, looks which looks very good. Um, 
this also sorts the books in level of difficulty. So the easy books um, will show on one, one set of shelves, the more difficult books on other sets of shelves. Um, and you can, so you read the Heaven Macmillan books and page turners, and I'll show you later a range of the books they've got. Um, it will then take you to the next page, which has the link to the ebook. And that will then take you to this page. And again, I'm, I'm off campus. So um, <laughs> Stuart has just written a very, very interesting suggestion. Um, this all sounds very complicated. Why not just use X reading? Um, X reading is a, is a great thing to use if you can use it. Um, and Paul will be talking more about X reading. The, the problem, the issue that we have in many places is that we, we don't have a budget to get X reading for all of our students. So if you do, if you can get X reading for your students, that's definitely the easy way. Um, if not, or indeed, if you do want to get eBooks um, for your students in general, uh, these are the ways of doing it. Uh, this is a list of the graded readers that are available in Marizen. And quite a wide range. Um, Ox Oxford is not available in Marizen. Oxford books, we had, we tr were trying to find Oxford books. Uh, they were available in li Library Air, uh, if you're trying to find Oxford books. So, um, so another question, I'm not sure if anyone else has this question, is, um, I have this question certainly, is, is do they want to read ebooks? And um, there is, I, I have started, um, so this year, in fact, um, I, in my classes and a couple of other classes, we did use X reading for the first semester. And for the second semester, we had the students read ebooks and read books from the library and keep track of the books that we're reading. And those students, I've previous, previously asked students about ebooks, and the, the feedback I've tended to get from students is that they don't really like ebooks, they prefer reading on paper. Um, what's happened this year is they've had to read ebooks, and I, the evidence seems to be that um, students, these are, these are two bits of two bits of two questions at, at the end of, I asked 60 students um, at the end of the year, having spent the first semester reading X reading, so reading online only in the first semester, the second semester reading, some reading online, also able to go and borrow books from the library as they were now allowed on the campus. Um, the blue is whether they were reading on paper over to the left, over to the left is only on paper, over to the right is only reading online. So most of the students are reading only online or mostly online. Um, and I also asked which they prefer um, to read online or on paper. And more people seem to prefer to read online than reading on paper. Um, which I found interesting. Um, we also asked them why they prefer to read online or why they prefer to read on paper. Um, and the answers, so these are some of the reasons why they, um, some of them seem to prefer to read on, online for perhaps not the best reasons. <laughs> Um, that I would kind of paraphrase this as I can't be bothered to go to the library. Uh, there are also, I think, other other less cynical reasons that it's managing the time. Um, they can read the book at, in their own time at their favourite time. Um, online books are portable. If I download as PDFs, I can read them even offline. And that they can, this is the changing the size of the, the screen makes it easier to read. Um, so there are reasons. Um, there are also still, um, I, I do um, still think that reading on paper is, is a good idea. 
And some of the reasons, these are some of the reasons that people prefer paper, um, that they, their eyes get tired. Um, I, the, another reason for reading paper books is the same reason as people gave for re reading the eBooks is that they can read them anywhere. Um, and there are some more interesting answers that the, um, this is saying that um, the, when they read on paper, the content goes more easily into their head. Uh, they think paper books are easy to understand. Uh, when they're reading online, they don't feel like they're reading. And um, they feel that they're reading when they turn pages and they want to touch paper. And also like a practical thing, paper books, it's easy to see how far you've read. Um, so uh, I guess um, that's, that's all I have to say. <laughs> um, I can, I'll probably, there's a, a little bit of time for questions before we go over to Paul. Hmm. So uh, thank you. Cool, thanks, Mark. So shall we open the floor to questions? Well, we could do questions now or, or joint questions. I, I'm okay for either one. I thought we had discussed joint at the end, but if anybody has a specific question or can't stay till the end, mm. it would be such a, a mistake to leave. But anyway. Yeah. Um, hello. Sorry, I can't. That sounds like me. Neil, is it? Yeah, it's me. It's Neil. Um, sorry, yeah, I, go can't ahead, find, I can't find the hand thing. Uh, All right, yeah. I okay. And I, I'm not an expert. On, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Uh, I'm not an expert on um, <clears throat> extensive reading, although obviously I think it's a good idea. Uh, but. On the, I, I don't normally teach reading courses particularly, especially, uh, but on the occasion when I've tried to encourage better students to go in the library and sometimes even go in the library with them and get them to look at the extensive reading books, the graded readers that we have, which is not much. And then I sort of say to them, well, you know, something or other like, you want to try and pick a book where you, you know, there's only like, you know, not more than 20 words on the page that you don't know or something. And so then we go through a few books and they count the words they don't know on a page and you say, okay, well then that makes you level five. The first thing they do is they pick a book at level eight, um, which I suppose is kind of their pride or something working there. So I wonder if you've got any experience of that, Mark, and if you've got any kind of idea about how to stop people doing that. Yeah, you just, you need to, um, you kind of need to show them. Th this is another, another great thing about reading with class, reading in the classroom is that you can actually see what they're reading and you can go, you can give them a book and say, read this and actually start them reading books that are at the right level for their fluent reading um the other thing and, and of course that's something that we can do with when they're reading online there are ways to limit what they read online um if you're using a system like mreader or xreading um the other thing that i do is measure their or get them to measure their reading speed and when they can see how quickly that they're reading um if because if they if they're going to read i mean the, it's not it's not 20 words per page that they don't know it's it's two words per page that they don't know if there are more than two words on a page they don't know that book is is too difficult it's above their their reading level so the, and if they if you again in class if you have the students in the classroom they can measure their reading speed and if they're reading um and you can show them um like 60 words per minute um, I have a, I have some slides which flash up in Japanese one word per second, and it's incredibly painful reading at that speed. And if they can, if you can explain and, and show them, this is what reading speed you're reading at. This is how many words you can read. If you're reading at a faster speed, you're reading more words. You're becoming more fluent, and and kind of emphasize that it's it's not weight lifting. 
it's it's fluency because I think it's very again it's 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 very natural for them to when if you're teaching university students it's very natural for them to pick a really difficult book because that's what they were given at high school as their textbook so they expect they assume that English is going to be something difficult and also that you know they're they're not they're not kids they want to read something those are the the books that they want to read so the the way I think the you need to um, uh, force them, force them to read easy books, and and then and, and show them show them fluency and show them reading speed. I think if that's some, um, if that helps. Uh, that's a great answer. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? And after, if we get one more question, and then we'll take a break. I got one. If that's okay. Please, 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 please. Yes. No, we'll, we'll keep it short. So, so you said in one semester they're using X reading, and one semester they're trying to jump through the um, your in school system doing e learning, e reading that way. Which they're also, also they would um, the library. They were able to read library books as well, okay. so they had a choice of library books or e books. Generally, which which system kind of helped increase reading amount? um i think that's very difficult to say i think the i think x reading was a very good introduction to extensive reading um they t what tends to happen is there's a fall off in the second semester so the first semester you get the students reading um they go away for two months in the summer and they come back and some of them don't really start again um whereas the the figures look like they've read there, there was seems to have been less drop off this year and i think x reading is a very good way to to get them to get them reading and to get them into um into e-reading it's i i it's difficult to say um yeah it's difficult to say i think it's it's, it's there's a traje a trajectory but, so but going maybe, from uh, yeah go on i was just thinking maybe then the the X reading provides accessibility, easy accessibility. So if the teacher does their job and motivates the students, X reading allows students to run with that motivation. And it, and it doesn't provide walls like the complicated system you showed or the other issues of going to the library. So if, if the teachers can keep the motivation up, I've always found that X reading is, it, it, it was the same with M reader, like, um, Tom would show that most books were read at after 1 a.m. in the morning when libraries right. tend not to be open. Yep. Yes. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it is. But uh, there's, uh, um, for, I mean, one thing, one thing is the, like, practically, uh, it's not possible for some universities to get X reading for their students. Um, and, and also, I think there's, I think we do, at some point, they have to read at some point reading on paper um there are there are very very real comments of people who prefer to read on paper um and don't really like reading online so there's two so but yeah i agree yeah it's some um, yes but maybe at the same time you can paul can confirm this can you read a book on paper and then take an next reading quiz yeah you can yes, yes. okay well that just because you have X reading doesn't stop someone from reading a book. Yeah, but if you don't have money, it does stop okay. you from using X reading. Yeah, uh, so but my, right. my, my point is more, if you can use X reading, I can't see why people don't. Right. Yep. Yes, well, yes, I'm sure Paul will tell us more about that after the break. All right, well, um, Let's have a break and then if there are... Um, like I said, I'm, I'm happy everybody's here. Uh, please bear with me. I've been having internet problems for the past few weeks, not ideal when you own a, an online uh, company. 
Uh, but I, I think I haven't figured it out tonight. If, I, if you lose me for a second, I have a backup and, and then a second backup. Um, also, I noticed that just looking at all the attendees who are here, it looks like from, from the names I recognize, uh, a number of people uh, are using X Reading currently. Some people have used it before. Uh, some people have heard of it and never used it. And then there's some people I think uh, have never used it and don't know too much about it. So I'll try to make this presentation useful for everybody. Uh, and I think the uh, presentation by Mark really, uh, you know, brought up a lot of good points uh, relative to what I'm going to be talking about. Okay. Um, so I'd like to start out where I got interested in extensive reading when I first came to Japan uh, in 2004. I was introduced to the ideas of extensive reading. I implemented it in my classes at the university. In my reading classes, students had to read one book every week. And it was a, generally a very successful uh, experience. The students uh, made significant improvements in their reading fluency. Uh, they, their to TOEFL scores went up. And they reported that they enjoyed doing it very much. So I was very satisfied. However, as a teacher, I ran into a lot of problems trying to implement the program. And I spoke to other teachers, and they had similar problems. And the main problems teachers found with extensive reading were, number one, monitoring if and when their students were reading. Okay, uh, I know very often people say extensive reading is all about students reading for pleasure, reading as much as they want. But the reality is, if in an academic context where students have lots of other work to do, if they're not being monitored and assessed, they're not going to do it. So assessment was also very important, especially because students at my university would get to travel abroad and choose their country based on their grades. So they took their grades seriously. Uh, tracking and recording what students are reading. Uh, getting students to select books at the appropriate level was difficult. Uh, getting students to read regularly. I had very good students. I would say, please read 20 books this semester. And almost all of my students would do it but they would wait until the very last week of the semester. Not really what I wanted them to be doing. Uh, integrating the audio was challenging. Um, then, and especially now, for whatever reason, I don't know, in 2020, well, sorry, 2021, most publishers still produce the audio narrations for their books on CDs. I, I don't know who they're thinking have CD players in, in their houses anymore, uh, but that's how the, the audio is made accessible. Uh, and graded readers are relatively expensive. Uh, the print books are maybe anywhere from uh, 800 to 1200 to 1600 yen, uh, much less than a textbook, but students don't benefit from one book. They need a lot and therefore become very expensive. Therefore, most schools will have their students get books from the library. The library is great because it's free for students, but there's a lot of limitations, um, which Mark just spoke about. So I'm just going to review these very quickly. Uh, the main one is just a limited number of books and very few CDs. Uh, limited copies. Uh, extensive reading is traditionally about students choosing their own book, but there's more and more research coming out showing that students actually like reading the same book as their classmates. Not every time, but sometimes. And if a library doesn't have 25 or 35 copies of a book, it's not really possible. Uh, books may not be available when the student wants the books. Uh, limited control over which books students can select when they go into the library. Uh, books deteriorate and get lost. Uh, I don't think Japanese students are going to be stealing graded readers, but they forget them, leave them on the train or, or just lose them in their house somewhere. Somebody has to manage a library. Um, it would be great if the university library wants to do that, but many university libraries don't want to keep a lot of graded readers. And that leaves it up then to the, the department that wants to have an extensive reading program. And they have to then keep track of all their books, which can be very burdensome. Uh, the school library isn't always accessible for students. I swear when I made that point, I was thinking of you know the weekend, late night, uh, summer vacation. I was not actually thinking of pandemics. But as we've seen this past year, if students can't get to the library, it makes things quite difficult, okay? And they haven't been able this year. And finally, libraries don't typically have digital copies of graded readers. Uh, Mark pointed out some options. Um, I've 
looked at some of those and I, and I found them to be very lacking. Kind of as Stuart pointed out, they, there's just a lot of barriers. Okay, so because of all these problems I was facing and my colleagues were facing, I decided to look for a solution. I couldn't really find one, so I came up with my own, which I'm sure you won't be too surprised. It's called X Reading VL. is a virtual library of graded readers students can access anywhere, anytime, with no limitations. The mission is simply making extensive reading easier for teachers, to implement more accessible for students, and more profitable for publishers. Okay, uh, a quick overview. It's an online library of over 1,300 graded readers from almost every major publisher. Okay, it provides unlimited simultaneous use, means every student can read every book at the same time if they want to. So 1,300 is not really such an accurate number. It's 1,300 books per student. So if a school has 1,000 students, that's equivalent to a library, a physical library of 1.3 million graded readers. Okay, so I think that's you know, an important point to understand. It also means any book can be a class reader anytime the teacher wants it to be. Works on computers and mobile devices. Uh, we have the audio for almost every book. We have quizzes, background information, things like that. And a standardized level system. So you don't have to worry about different publishers having different levels and students not knowing how they match. As far as I know, it's the only um, digital library with books from multiple publishers uh, that give simultaneous unlimited uh, use and it's then linked to a learner management system or an LMS. I imagine most people know what that means. Uh, and this allows teachers to track all of their students reading progress. Okay, not just the books they read, but how many words they read, how many minutes they read, uh, their reading speed and things like that, which I'll be showing a little bit later. You can also assess their understanding through the quizzes guide their selections and assign activities. Okay, uh, we're constantly adding new publishers. Just in the past six months, we added ILTS, uh, not a very famous publisher, but they do have some, I think the most award-winning books from the Extensive Reading Foundation. I think they've won 12 or 18 awards with only uh, 60 books. So they have very, very good quality stories. A Grassroots Press, a, a new publisher from Canada with very good biographies and uh, these books are primarily written for immigrant students in Canada but they're very appropriate for students anywhere. Uh, and finally we're adding more children's books. Uh, we just partnered with a publisher out of New Zealand called Sunshine Books and we now have about 75 books for, for younger learners or beginners. Um, the system works on computers. Okay this is uh, works on tablets works on smartphones. A key point is we use adaptive text. Okay, if you don't know what that means, adaptive text means the text reflows or repositions itself to the device. The opposite is fixed image. An example of fixed image is a PDF. Okay, um, so on a computer or tablet, it doesn't make much difference. Okay, it's on a smartphone, it makes a huge difference. This is what adaptive text looks like. This is a PDF, okay? Obviously to read that, you're going to have to pinch and zoom, not very convenient, okay? Um, okay, next I'm gonna get into uh, a demonstration of what X reading looks like. Uh, for those of you who've been using X reading, this will obviously be much of a review, but I will be showing you the new features after I go through the, the main functionality, okay? So, so please bear with me. Uh, so I've designed X reading uh, for teachers who are not very tech savvy. I, I myself, uh, I always joke, I'm the least tech savvy owner of a tech company in the world. Uh, I just, I'm never, not that comfortable using technology. And I designed X reading for people like me, people who love extensive reading and want to integrate it with their classes, but don't want a lot of technical challenges. So this is the instructor setup. We made it very simple. Three things a teacher needs to do, create a class, add their students and create an assignment. Okay, pretty standard for any learner management system. A teacher, this is, will log in the first time. I think you can, can you see my mouse on the screen? Yeah, okay. 
So this is the classes page. You can see I have no active classes. So the add button is always on the right side. I press add. I could add a batch of classes if it's a big program, but I will add a single class. Put the class name, the open date, choose the close date, and decide which semester this is, and save it. It literally takes 20 seconds to create a new class. Okay, you notice when the class is created, it has an enrollment code. Again, this is pretty standard with uh, a learner management system, but I'll show you where this is used in a moment. Next step is adding students. Press the add student button. This time we'll add a batch of students uh, using a spreadsheet. You can download a spreadsheet so you don't have to worry about what it looks like and you can even select which columns you want. In other words, if your school has a student number, you can include that. If the birth family name and given name are in the same cell or different cells, you can choose whatever is most suitable. You download the spreadsheet and you can copy and paste your student information right into it. This is where the enrollment code is important. You just put the enrollment code right there. And not only are you adding students to X reading, you are putting them into their correct class. It also means you can put students from multiple classes into one spreadsheet. Okay, this gets saved and uploaded. This is just a confirmation to make sure these are the correct students. I will save it and add it. Okay, that's all it takes to get things set up. The last step finally is an assignment. An assignment is simply a period of time that you want your students to do something. So it could be the whole semester and you can decide read 10 books or 100,000 words. The problem with that is students will tend to wait until the end of the deadline. So my suggestion usually is to create shorter assignments, whether it's a week, two weeks or a month, something to give interim, interim deadlines for your students. Here's also where we have a lot of settings. For example, if you want to turn the quizzes on or off, if you want to restrict certain books, but most teachers leave the default. You don't have to worry about changing it if you don't want to. You submit it. Sorry, you enter, enter the, the uh, information, what the assignment name and the open date, close date, and then you're done. That's the whole teacher setup. Okay. I'll now move to the student side. This is what students need to do. Again, I wanted to make it super simple. Uh, Japan is known as being a very high tech country by experience. I'm sure many of you have students who are not that high tech, especially using a computer. So made three easy steps. Log in, select a book and read. Hopefully they can handle that. Okay, so a student will log in the first time they see the big add book button here. When they press that, they see a library of all the books. Uh, they can browse or narrow by your typical criteria, level, genre, headwords, publisher, things like that. We're adding some unique ones. For example, protagonist. Uh, if a student wants to find maybe every book with a female young adult protagonist, you can instantly find them. Okay. Uh, also something else we did, I, I remember Mark mentioned that uh, there's benefits to going to the real library. Students can actually, you know, feel the book. Well, on a digital system, you can't feel it, but we have something called more info, which is supposed to mirror going to the library. You can get the back cover summary and the metadata. How many words? Is it British English? Is it American English? Is there audio? How many minutes is the audio? Things like that. Text preview. The student can listen to the first minute, uh, sorry, read the first 5% uh, of the book to see if it's something they will enjoy. Audio preview, they can listen to the first minute. I think the most important ones are actually towards the bottom. Uh, characters, students often complain one of the most difficult aspects of extensive reading is keeping track of the characters, especially the classics, uh, because the names are so unfamiliar. So we are in the process of adding a character list for every book. Not only that, but we're also indicating the importance of the character. Of course, that's subjective. Uh, but it gives students a good idea, is this a character I need to remember or not? And maybe most important are ratings. I wish I could say every book, every graded reader in the world, or at least every graded reader on X reading is wonderful. Uh, but the reality is some are better than others. And our goal as teachers is, for, is to direct students to the better books. And that's hopefully what the ratings will do. The student says, yes, this is the book I want. They select it. This is what it looks like on a computer. 
Uh, most important to notice is this progress bar up here at the top left. Okay, when the student presses next, the progress bar moves forward. So they do get an idea. It's maybe again, not the same as holding a book in your hands, but they get an idea how far they're getting through the book. They can go back, although for this demonstration, we'll continue going forward, and you can see the progress bar moving forward. When a student closes the book, it will save their position. So if they read up to chapter two, they shut, up, shut it down, they come back a few hours later, they log in, it'll bring them right back to chapter two. Okay. When a student closes the book, they can see all of their reading data. And I think for teachers, this is probably the most important slide of the demonstration. You can see all the data that is collected for the student. So we we're just reading A Little Princess. It's level two, 2,044 words in the book. It tracks how many words the student has read, 326. I should say read because we don't really know if the student has read. That's how many words were on the screen. Uh, therefore, it can calculate the percent read, 16%. More importantly, it tracks the reading time, in this case, 22 seconds. Therefore, it can calculate the reading speed, 445 words per minute. I think this is extremely important. Number one, as Mark said at the beginning of his presentation, reading fluency is a big part of extensive reading, but teachers rarely know their students' reading speed. So this is a great way to know which of your students are our having trouble or reading too slowly and need to be encouraged either to read quicker or choose easier books or the teacher can try to determine the problem. This helps set them in the right direction. The second benefit, um, cheating I don't think is such a big problem, but it happens sometimes and this is a great way to catch students, okay? Uh, I'm a nice guy, I don't like to accuse students directly of cheating, but every semester on the, on the probably the second day of class, there'll be at least one maybe a few students, I'll be like, oh, Toshiko, congratulations, you read your first book, Tom Sawyer, 5,552 words. That was great. Uh, especially, you did it in two minutes, right before class today. Could you please explain that? And she knows she's been caught, okay? Now, you might think, well, a student who's going to cheat, maybe she's very determined to cheat, what will she do next time? Maybe she'll open the book on the computer or on her phone, and then go do something else, uh, texting or Facebook, Instagram, something like that. Not gonna work that easily because we have an activity timer built into the book. That means if a student opens the book and walks away, after one minute, a pop-up will come and says, hello, Toshiko, are you really here? If Toshiko doesn't reply within, I think, 10 seconds, the book closes automatically, okay? I would never claim X reading can prevent all cheating, that's impossible, but it definitely makes it a lot more challenging, okay? Uh, I typically stop here to see if anybody has any questions about the data, um, but maybe I'll, I'll hold questions until the end, okay? I also wanna let people know, uh, I will be very happy to share a copy of this uh, with anybody who wants afterwards, okay? Uh, so moving on, some additional features for students. It's a digital system, so there's some nice benefits to that. Uh, again, physical books do have their benefits as well, but a nice benefit of digital is you can change uh, what you're looking at. You can make the fonts, the print larger, you can make the spacing larger, you can even make the background color different, okay? Could be very useful depending on where the student is reading. I've also read that uh, certain colors make it easier for students who have dyslexia and uh, especially the black background and white, and there's also certain fonts that we'll be adding shortly. We have quizzes for every book. These quizzes are designed specifically for extensive reading, meaning we're not asking small details. We're asking major details about the story. Hopefully there's something the student will remember after they finished. Uh, anybody who's familiar with M reader quizzes, these are quite different. These are only five questions, major details. Okay, uh, another benefit, although one that's very used very infrequently, the teacher can actually print the quizzes and administer them in class. Now you might think, well, I have 25 or 35 students, it's going to take forever to figure out who gets which book quiz. However, it's actually not that difficult because if you notice, they print with the students' names at the top. So it's very easy to distribute them. 
But you might also think, well, still 35 different quizzes, 35 different answer keys, it will be a nightmare to grade. Actually, you can set the answer key to be the same for every quiz, just don't tell the students. Okay, because if a student is reading, one student's reading Dracula and the other one's reading Anne of Green Gables, they're probably not gonna look at each other's quiz. Okay, and in that case, you can grade 35 quizzes in about two minutes. Students can rate books when they finish reading the book. That's where we get the rating from. And they can also write a short review. Uh, I think a very important feature is audio on demand. Extensive listening can be very helpful for students. So instead of having to dig out a, a CD player or look for a publisher's website to find where the audio is, while the student is reading, they can just press play. However, there's some distinct differences between extensive reading and extensive listening. A big one is speed. Okay, when reading, who chooses, when, when a student is reading, who chooses their speed? The student, like each of us has our own reading speed. But while listening, who chooses the speed? Well, the narration, the narrator, the audio or the publisher. The student has no control and the speed of the audio may not match their ability or the speed that they want to read at and it may be actually more distracting. Therefore, we've entered, oh, added a very unique feature is five speeds without distortion. Okay, so the student can speed up the audio from the original speed 10% faster, 20% faster, 10% slower, 20% slower, and it will not sound strange. Okay, I'm going to play. I, Mark, I noticed you didn't weren't able to play the audio, so I'm going to try. Let me know if you can hear this. If someone can give me a thumbs up. I'm going to play the original speed from the audio. Okay, and we'll see. Hopefully, you can hear this. This is what the publisher has created. Please read and listen. Let me know what you think about this speed. Chapter one. Down the rabbit hole. Alice was beginning to get very bored. She and her sister were sitting under the trees. Her sister was reading, but Alice had nothing to do. Okay, what do you think? I, most teachers I've heard find that to be quite slow. Okay, uh, so we're going to speed it up the full 20%. Uh, any of you know Alvin the Chipmunks, that's actually 25%. Okay, let's listen. Alice was beginning to get very bored. She and her sister were sitting under the trees. Okay, I think you can hear it sounds quite natural. Just to prove my point uh, a little more, this is the same speed without removing the distortion. Chapter one, down the rabbit hole. Alice was beginning to get very bored. She and her sister were sitting under the trees. Her sister was reading, but Alice have nothing to do. Okay, so I think you can hear it makes a huge difference when you remove the distortion. Uh, last year, we added a very unique feature. Um, from my experience, and I think this, think this is an area that needs research, is when students are reading and listening for a long period of time, they will default to their stronger skill. What I mean is Japanese students, if they're reading and listening for a few minutes, they're, they're more than a few minutes, their brain will get tired and they'll start reading because they can read better than they can listen and the audio will just become noise in the background. It's not universal from my experience with students from the, the Middle East, in particular Saudi Arabia, it's exactly the opposite. Their listening proficiency tends to be better than their reading. And if they're reading and listening for a long period of time, they will actually close their eyes and focus on the audio. So the reason I mention that, let's say you're teaching a listening class and you want your students to focus on listening or you just want your students to improve their listening. How can you do that? Well, we added a feature you can see here, text and audio accessibility. This lets you turn off the text or turn off the audio. I don't suggest turning off both. Um, anyway, if you can turn off the audio, you can imagine the audio, the play button disappears. But how about allow audio only, no text? What does that look like? Here you can see the student can still see the book, still see the pictures, but they can't read the text. Okay, some that's all for the student side. I want to show you the teacher side now. Uh, main benefit of X reading is, is monitoring all your students' data. Okay, so 
like any learner management system, or I guess most of them, I can see a list of all of my classes and get a quick summary. I can then select one class and see every student. I can instantly know how many books they've read, how many words they've read, how many minutes they've read, their average reading speed, and their average quiz score. This can be downloaded to Excel. I can filter by different dates. So it's a very, very powerful tool for teachers uh, for assessing their students or, or maybe even doing research. I can then select a specific student and I can see every book the student has read and when they read it. Okay, uh, you notice the pink? Pink's there because in my assignment settings, I decided as the teacher a minimum quiz score for passing the quiz and a maximum reading speed. If the student is outside of those parameters, they do not get credit for the book and it becomes pink. So in this total down here, it does not include these two books. This one because of the uh, failed score and the high reading speed, and this one just because they haven't taken the quiz yet. Okay. Uh, if a student complains, uh, you know, I a teacher, I was taking the quiz and my house got hit by lightning or something. Uh, no problem. The teacher can just press the edit icon right here and reset the quiz for the student. Okay, or change the reading. Okay. Um, other made important ability for teachers is the ability to restrict the library. Okay, there's something called library access. On all of these criteria, I can restrict which book students my, can, my students can select. So for example, these are the 14 levels. If I uncheck any of these, students will not see those books. Uh, the one I use more frequently actually is words in a story. I want my students to read one book a week, but I don't want them to choose a very short book. I just go here, uncheck, 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 uncheck. And the shortest book they can possibly read is 3,000 words. Okay. Let's say you want all of your students to read the same book or, or, or small group of books. You can do that also. There's something called select specific titles. Uh, I want all my students to read a book called Egghead. Okay, it's actually a really good book. It's an award-winning book uh, about bullying. So it, it's quite topical. I've chosen this book for my assignment. I submit it. Now, when a student presses add book, they will see only a okay. Um, next thing I want to talk about is we have actually integrated in reader into oh, I'm sorry, is there a question that I should address? No. Okay, so those of you who are not familiar, mReader is a quiz website with about with quizzes for about 7,000 graded readers. It's a really amazing website because it's free. Uh, however, the quiz quality is, I, in my opinion, is not that great. They're written by volunteers around the world. Um, so you get a lot of variety. So why have we integrated these quizzes into X Reading is because it allows schools to integrate their physical library into X Reading. And this, I think also, goes back to what Mark was saying, some students prefer physical books, or maybe there's some physical books we don't have in X Reading that a student really wants to read. Again, we have 1300 books in X Reading, and Reader has quizzes for over 7,000. So this could be very useful. There's a setting called allow physical books. The teacher can change it to yes. Now, for example, the student chooses this book, Pirates of the Caribbean. This is a physical book. This book is not in X Reading. It's actually not a very good book at all, but uh, it's quite popular with Johnny Depp, although maybe it won't be so much popular anymore. Um, anyway, student chooses this book, they read it, they go to X Reading and they press Add Book. Now they're given the choice, physical book, physical or digital, they choose physical, they search for it. Oh, here it is, they add it. Again, this book, which is not in the X Reading library, will show up in their reading history. If they take the M Reader quiz for it, and pass, then we give them the word credit. Okay, so it really makes it ideal for schools uh, that are using X Reading this year because of, of uh, remote teaching and want to continue using it next year, they can still, with their physical library, they can still integrate both. Okay, um, that's all the main functionality. All this was has been there for, for a couple of years now, at least since last year. What I'd like to talk about now are the new features starting from April 2021, which is basically meeting the challenges of remote teaching. Okay, the challenges I've been hearing from talking to teachers are 
monitoring students' activity. I don't mean monitoring what they've done, but what are they doing right now? When teachers are in class, as, as Mark pointed out, you can see when they're holding the physical book. But when they're reading online, especially in remote class teaching, it becomes a lot more challenging. Communicating with students obviously is more challenging, motivating them to read more, and, and knowing what books your students are reading. So we made, and some of these we were already in the process of finding solutions to, uh, but during the pandemic, we made them a higher priority. So I'm gonna go through these now. Uh, the, some of these, actually, if it says new feature, these have already been added in the past couple of weeks, uh, and some will hopefully be added before April, the start of the school year in Japan. So I think the most exciting one, the one I'm most excited about, is live monitoring. Okay, this solves the problem of knowing what your students are doing. So I can see a list of all my students in my class. Maybe right now is class time. I don't know what are these students actually doing. I told them to read. They said they're reading, but how do I know? Well, I can press live monitor and wait a moment. And it will tell me exactly what the students are doing. I think it, re I think it reloads every 15 seconds. So it gives a pretty good idea. Is the student reading? What book they're reading? Are they taking the quiz? Are they looking at the library? Um, or are they logged in but not active, which is actually the one teachers are probably most interested in, meaning they've gone off and done something else. Of course, they may have a legitimate reason, uh, but this gives teachers some very useful information, especially during remote teaching. Uh, to address the inability to contact teachers, we've added an announcements feature. You can select specific classes, all your classes, specific students even, write an announcement, by default, this announcement will be sent immediately and end when the student closes it, or you can set an open and close date for the announcement. When you post it, students will see the announcement really on whatever, this is their homepage, whatever page they are on, they will see that announcement at that time. Okay, so it could be very useful, um, but it is, it's an announcement, one-way communication. So what we plan to add, hopefully by April, if not a little bit later in the spring, is a messenger or messaging system where teachers can communicate directly with students and students can reply directly to teachers. Okay, again, uh, nice to have that anytime, but in particular, if we're doing remote teaching. Uh, goals, uh, this is the ability for teachers to create a goal for a specific class or even an assignment so students know if they're making progress and hopefully that will motivate them towards reaching that goal. So again, for those of you who are using X Reading, this is a, a new feature. Um, it's connected to the classes page or the assignments page. You select books or words. I prefer words. I want my students to read a certain number of words and I can indicate how many words I want them to read for this particular assignment. I can choose the classes and I create the goal. When students go to their homepage, they will then see their progress towards the assignment goal, this is their assignment information and their class information. Okay, so again, it, it, hopefully that will be a motivating factor for students. Uh, something else we've created actually on, on the request of one university, but worked very well is an X Reading Certificate of Achievement. Uh, and this works well with the goals. So we are happy, this is editable and we're happy to provide these to schools if you want to reward or award your students for whatever accomplishments you feel are uh, deserving. Uh, an upcoming feature for later on is actually we will be creating badges in X Reading for students who make certain uh, reading goals and those will automatically be given to the students. This one can actually be printed by the teacher. Uh, book usage. Again, Mark talked about this before. Schools, not every teacher cares about this, but many teachers want to know what books are my students reading? Which are the most popular books? Okay, so there's a new feature called book usage. Uh, it's actually, it's been there for a few, for a, a couple of months. You go there and you can see every book in X reading and know how many of your students have read that book. You can filter by certain dates, even by specific semesters or classes. Okay, it could be very useful for knowing which are the most popular books in your school. Uh, you can also then select, this is the new feature, you can select a specific book and it will tell you every student who read that book, when they read it, and what their quiz score is. Again, useful for knowing which are your popular books, and also 
kind of useful if you suspect cheating might be going on, as if you notice suddenly a book like, I don't know, Wuthering Heights is suddenly being read by uh, 20 students at the same time. Okay. Another new feature is book information. Not quite as exciting, but sometimes teachers will be looking at their students' uh, information and be like, oh, a student read this book, but what, what actually is Bird Girl? What is this book? You can tap on it on any page that you see the book cover and the teacher can get information about that book. Okay. Uh, some upcoming, so those all those features, except for the email, uh, the messaging are all currently there. Some upcoming features are pre-reading vocabulary. Um, as I think you know most, uh, many of the easier books come with a uh, section at the beginning of the book showing pictures and images, uh, sorry, images and vocabulary words. Students typically skip over those. So what we're doing is going to make it an interactive activity. Students can press preview vocabulary. The teacher can make this optional or required or turn it off if they don't want it. But students will see the words from that um, vocabulary page, a pre-reading page, and they can do a kind of a short quiz. Oh, is that right? Oh, sorry. Try again. Okay, confirm. And it's correct. Okay, so again, the idea is letting students be a little bit more active with the vocabulary as opposed to just looking at a static page, which they usually skip over very quickly. Uh, this feature is really just anybody who's using X reading will understand this feature. If you're not using it, it probably will, will not be very appreciated. But sometimes a student has failed a book, but you know they really passed. Maybe their reading speed was a little bit faster than it should have been, but because they're a very good student, better than the other students in the class, and then you're stuck having to change their reading speed. Uh, or they fail the quiz, but you can say, see they really read the book, just the quiz question was a little bit difficult. Uh, we used to have this manage reading data. We are now adding a new checkbox right here. So as I said previously, you could only reset the quiz or change their score. Now you can give them credit without changing any of their original reading data. Okay. Uh, another feature many teachers who are using X reading have asked for is the ability to give students bonus words. This could be either as a, just a reward to your students because they're wonderful, or maybe a student read something that's not in X reading and not an M reader, and you still want to give them credit. Well, we have something here called bonus words. You check on that. You can decide which assignment will go to, how many words, and which students you want to give it to. And that student will now have a bonus words in his um, reading history. Okay. Uh, finally, just some more features we have coming at the end of uh, 2021 or 2022. Uh, we'll be adding a leaderboard. Hopefully that will get students more excited to read, competitions and things like that. X reading for independent authors. We uh, originally, the publishers told us that no independent authors, because they did not want an independent author putting their books in X reading, benefiting from the publisher's name, which is why many schools were going to X reading. But publishers have, have loosened up on that. And now we can put books from independent authors, which are typically teachers. And so far, we have three books from independent authors. And they've been extremely popular. I tend to think teachers know what their students want to read. Uh, although in one case, I think the teacher actually required all of his students to read it. That's another story. Um, books that are major specific. What I mean is we're actually going, we're in the middle of developing a graded readers for specific university majors. So right now, um, actually, I, can, I think I can say Rob Waring is currently writing a series of graded readers specifically for business majors. They're not Nonfiction, like or there's plenty of nonfiction books. These are fiction stories, but the context is business. And once we're done with those, we're going to be looking at different majors because our idea is that it will just be more interesting for students to be reading books related to their major. Uh, books about contemporary social issues. I saw Matt Cotter before. I don't know if he's still here, but I'm referring to the, a series of books that he's been part of. Uh, books about some really serious issues, but are, are important these days. Uh, human trafficking. Uh, uh, different cultures. Um, I'm sorry, I can't remember some of the other topics, but they're, they're really things that you would see in the news. But again, in a uh, fiction story, which makes it, I think, a lot more engaging for students. Uh, we're going to trial a student writing competition where students will write their own short stories. 
we can upload them to X Reading for that specific school. The students will read and vote on their best story. And we will then let other students outside of that school read the story. Uh, offline access, so students don't need to be relying on, on internet. In Japan, that's not really a problem, but in other countries it is. And finally, an interactive dictionary where students will be able to tap on a word, get the meaning, and that word will be saved to their personal word list. And we will then give them games and activities for learning and uh, practicing their words using spaced repetition. Okay, that's just about everything I want to show. Just one, if I could make a plug here, if you don't mind, uh, since I imagine most of you are interested in extensive reading, that's why you joined the Extensive Reading World Congress that was supposed to be this summer in Indonesia has been postponed to 2022, but in place, there's going to be something called Extensive Reading Around the World. Uh, it's going to be a two-day conference. Uh, they're hoping to, because I'll have, it'll be all around the world, and they're actually have, hoping to have it go for 24 hours. Uh, the submission headline is tomorrow evening, uh, but if you're interested, please visit the ER Foundation's website and uh, make a submission. Uh, and X Reading will actually be supporting any teachers who are presenting about X Reading. Um, and any teachers who are just using X Reading, we will pay the, the registration fee. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Um, I'm glad to see we haven't lost too many participants. And questions, or should I uh, come? Yeah. Questions all yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah, let's get some questions in. Okay, I'm, gonna I'm sure there's lots. Yeah, there are lots of chats. I haven't read any of the chats. I don't know if anything is specific for me. Yeah, Paul, if I might just grant, if I might ask a quick question. Sure. Um, so in order for the this, if, for example, if students don't have an email account, is it still plausible? Oh, yeah, of course. Most, I mean, we have now about a third of the schools using X Reading are junior high schools and high schools. And most of them don't want to use email addresses, even if the students have. So, no, no email address is required. You can make whatever you want. Um, however, we do have to add a prefix just so someone else doesn't have the same username. Mm -hmm. That's all. Yeah. So in the LMS, you're, you're gonna use, like you were saying, you're gonna have hopefully a sort of a, a contact or messenger board thing? Yep. And it'll be directly, so if the student has an email address, you can choose to send the message to their, uh, um, you choose through X Reading and their email, but if they don't have an email address, just to X Reading. Thank you, yes. Great, thanks for the question. Hello, it's me, Mami. Hey, how are you? Nice to see you. Thanks. Thank you very much. I, 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 mommy saw me give, I gave the same presentation last weekend. I gave almost the same presentation in 10. Oh, I missed it. So, okay. That's good. You would have had yeah. it very quickly. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the new features are wonderful. And I wonder if all the new features are uh, available for teachers who are not administrators. Do you have to be an administrator to be able to use bonus words, announcement, live monitoring, and? Excellent question. And just if I say, mommy teaches at a program with thousands of students, so it's, it's very important for her. Um, the, that is going to be a feature that you, as the administrator, can turn on or turn off for your mm -hmm. teachers. Like right now, you know how you have the, so in some schools, it's just one teacher or a group of teachers sharing one account. Mm -hmm. In bigger programs, there's an administrator account and then teacher accounts. Mm -hmm. If you have an administrator account, there's a permission page mm -hmm. for teachers. And you can stop them from doing all sorts of things, including the new features. Like if you don't want your teachers making announcements, mm -hmm. you can stop them from doing that. Okay. Uh, if they do make announcements, they can only make them for their classes. Okay, great. Yeah, Thank good you. Question. Thank you. Sure. Oh, are there questions being... Um, uh, yes, Paul, one question by Shirley Young. Sure. Um, I'm sorry, Sergio Mazzarelli asked, uh, what does it cost? Oh, good question. So I think I actually have that. Let me see. Oh, no, I'm not doing screen share anymore. Sorry. Um, it's about, it's 2,500 yen per year per student. Uh, our goal was, my goal was I wanted to be less expensive than three graded readers. So it's 2,500 yen for the year and 1,500 yen for one semester. However, if the school can pay directly, 
then we give a 20% discount as opposed to having the students purchase it themselves by buying access cards uh, from the bookstore. And sense. another question from Shirley Young said, um, can, a, can a teacher see if the students have chosen to read or just do the audio? Can you select audio only for all students? And if so, can you do that for a fixed period? Well, it's per assignment. So the assignments are anything the teacher wants. Assignment could be one day, the assignment could be the whole year. And the teacher can uh, determine if they want that assignment to be listening only. Uh, a nice feature of X Reading, which I, I didn't have time to explain, is a teacher can set up multiple assignments at the same time. So for example, some schools have a free reading assignment and a required reading assignment. So the required reading might have one book every week, and the free reading is the whole semester of students can read anything they want. So I know one university where they do have a listening assignment where they generally have lower level books, but listening only, and then a reading assignment where they have higher level books. Uh, Shirley, does that answer your question? Yes, thanks, Paul. Sure. And uh, Matt Cotter provided some links to the ABAC site that show the books he's um, involved with that you talked about, but someone asked, um, that are they available on X Reading now? Nah, soon. <laughs> I've been told by ABEX uh, next week uh, for the past three months. So <laughs> hopefully that next week will come soon. Uh, I, I believe by the beginning of the semester, they'll have those books on X Reading. Uh, Matt may know more than I do about that. I, I haven't been in touch with ABEX. That was his question. Um, someone said, I had a great avatar. Thank you very much. Um, and someone asked um, how your server capability. Ah, who, may I ask who asked that? Um, Amaraj Jargal Zina. Oh, okay. Oh, from Mongolia. Fantastic. Uh, so anybody who was using X Reading last semester, uh, my apologies once again, because of the high number of, high amount of usage was unexpected. We had some technical issues. Uh, we are well past those. So the, the site can handle uh, far more users than we're getting right now and then we're expecting even for the upcoming semester. Yeah, so it, it should not be an issue for anybody anymore, but it certainly was last semester. And that goes back to what Mark said earlier. Mark used X reading with his students in the spring semester when we were having a lot of technical problems. And I can fully understand why students would prefer a print book as opposed to using a very convenient smartphone where X reading wouldn't load for three or four minutes because of, again, the, the connectivity problems we were having. Yeah, I think this question could be for both presenters. Uh, do you or anyone, uh, do you have tricks of the trade to motivate students avoiding extrinsic goals that may arguably reduce reading for fun? Mark, you wanna? Uh, by Tim Pritchard. That's a great question. Uh, yeah, I just, um, all is, is all I just wanted, hello, Mark, just wanted to say, um, I, I don't teach reading, actually, I, I will be teaching reading from April, but in the past, I've tried to be enthusiastic, and of course, I'm, I'm actually not a great reader, I'm not um, an avid reader, so um, I tell the students is very important, but I sense they believe, I don't really believe what I'm saying, but I do believe it, but I know other colleagues are really good at motivating students I think they just ooze that some people are here I won't embarrass them but they're they're very good at motivating their students they just read they just sense it's really good but yeah, I, I, think some, I think that's some I think it's a kind of religious religious thing that you have to you have to be more like a priest and really just believe setting goals. you have to show that you really believe in this and that you you yeah. think it's a really and that will some of that may kind of rub off on the students. So I don't, I don't think there's a, there's no kind of magic bullet. And I think it's different for different students as well. So some students who are very, um, like I, I'm, I, I originally come from like engineering and that way of thinking. And what, what got me into extensive reading was just the maths, like looking at graphs of word frequencies. It's just obvious that you mm. need to read a lot. It's, it's a no brainer. And if, but if you're, um, so if, if you have students who have that kind of, that way of thinking, then that's gonna work with those students. 
but different things are going to work for different students and there's no there's no kind of one trick so the more ways i think one thing is just try try as much as you have but above all it's you you just really have to believe in it and and show your students that you really believe in this mm. and then they'll then some of them some of them may may and then and then some of them may think it's worth doing <laughs> that's some i do i do have um there's an ex student who read tons she's always read since she was young and um she's actually appeared in our university magazine as she's got the virtually perfect toex score so it basically shows that reading i'd show the students this and um but she just she's a bit of an outlier reading tons but yeah i, I was going to add also uh in, interesting question that right before coronavirus hit uh tom robb and i were creating uh a book about ways to motivate students uh, everything extrinsic and intrinsic motivation we, we had to put that on hold uh but we presented on it several times so if, if Google Joel doesn't want to wait another six years to invite me back. I'd be very happy to share that presentation. Um, mm. But I, I think there are some. There, there. It's not a magic bullet, but like for example, one thing I discovered in my my previous teaching position, which I'm I'm very happy that uh, one of my colleagues who helped me come up with it uh, is here watching, was the idea of having students read the same book and then write either their own different ending or their own sequel. Okay, what's nice about that is that students become interested to hear about their colleagues, or sorry, their classmates. They've read the same book, but you know, they want to know what each one wrote about it. And so it makes them more motivated to read because otherwise that activity won't be very fun for them. And it's a fun activity for them to be engaged in. So I, I think there are a number of activities that teachers can. And of course, as Mark said, you really do need to preach to your students how beneficial and how enjoyable it can be. Um, but the reality is a lot of most students aren't going to just start enjoying or loving reading. Uh, there, there are a number of tricks that students, can, that teachers can implement. And I, you know, I'd be very happy to share those. Hopefully Tom and I will actually finish that, that paper and be able to share it with, with teachers more widely. Other questions? Uh, Shirley asks if there, if you know if there's a correlation between students who are readers in their own language and uh, graded reading. Just anecdotal for me. I've, I've uh, looked at this before from questionnaires and we didn't really find any. So yes. there, I think it's some, um, I, th I think it may, there's probably two contradictory things. One of them is if people are really good at reading in Japanese, then that may be a disincentive to read in English. Oh, okay. they're actually very comfortable reading in Japanese they can read very fluently and if they suddenly have to read in English it's they, it's like they're swimming with a with weights on them that they they slow they slow down or, or it may be and it may be the opposite if people um some people who don't like kanji um English is great there's no kanji so there may be there may be people who don't like reading in Japanese because of features of the Japanese language that English doesn't have and and you can almost and again if you're getting people to read from really easy books they may be some of them can really take to it but I don't know there's a there's a yeah what what makes some I think that's I'd, I'd like to do a lot more research to find out just who why, I was why just, people are reading yeah I was just curious about um whether or not people who are habitual readers in their own language um how they may or may not adapt or or just whether or not there was a correlation in terms of students who are actually focused on learning a new language so they may not be big readers in their own language but because they actually want to embrace the language are willing to do something that is not a natural habit for them <laughs> Um, and sorry, what kicked me off was Tim's question with regard to motivation. I was just thinking about it in relation to that. So, um, yeah, but obviously there's not much research being done on it, I assume. It would be great, a great thing to do research on. It's very, very helpful. Um, I have a question. Is there any, well, for me, anecdotally, there is, um, 
And for teachers who do graded reading, don't actually, aren't actually interested in doing graded reading themselves in Japanese. Um, have, you, have you noticed that? Or do you do, do you do graded reading yourself in a foreign language? I try. I tend to fall asleep. Yeah, the, the available I don't, I don't, in Japanese like in is class as well. If I I feel like as a if I was a Japanese teacher in Japan, then I would be sitting at the front of the class reading the English the same books as the students are reading. And I sometimes think if I I should if I read a but if I read a book in Japanese, then they're kind of the students are like, hey, the the teacher's just using he's supposed to be teaching us. <laughs> us English and he's just learning Japanese that's not that's not fair so I kind of um yeah and I, I feel I should read um I, sh I should uh, read French as well and problem is I think one problem the problem is tight that we have I think we just teachers are very busy and we have to spend so much time reading our students papers and reading there's too many things that we have to read that unfortunately we don't have time to to heal ourselves I can jump in, if I can make a plug for X reading for a moment, if you don't mind, um, that we're actually about to add 40 graded readers in French. Uh, the foundation reading library is being translated into French. Well, I think Mark, you actually knew that already. And uh, we will be adding Japanese and other languages over the next couple of years. So th there will be opportunities, at least using X reading. The biggest challenge is actually finding graded readers written in, in the various languages, especially at the lower levels is gonna be a challenge. Uh, but yeah, there's certainly cert, uh, people who wanna do it in different languages. Justin's had a hand up for some time. Justin, go ahead. You're muted, Justin. Sorry, thank you. Um, I have a question about the, the quizzes in X reading, because if different students are getting different quizzes for different books at the same time, can we be sure that the the date that the results are comparable? Is, is it valid? I don't quite follow. I mean, the quiz is just the quiz for the book. So if a student has read a difficult book or a student has read a short book, we don't we don't usually evaluate them on the quiz. We evaluate them on the words they've read. The quiz is just to confirm they actually read that book. Ah, gotcha. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure, sure. Other, I see. Yeah, uh, Shirley's got a hand up. Oh, um, am I unmuted? Yes. Sorry, Paul, this was, oh, whoever, actually, I think it was, yeah. Um, just a comment when you were talking about graded readers for in Japanese or whatever. When I first came to Japan, I bought children's books, mm -hmm. partly because they have the hiragana next to the kanji. And the main reason I bought them was because I realized that for my students, a lot of things they, for higher level students, a lot of reasons they find idioms and also other things difficult to penetrate um, when they're reading or just generally is because we have these cultural values that we've kind of absorbed um, osmotically as children when we've kind of um, been read certain fairy tales or just general tales and sort of children's literature that we don't think about but we have this kind of common knowledge base and so I actually wanted to read the Japanese sort of children's books from that perspective but um, in terms of graded reading and having the hiragana next to the kanji I actually found that really helpful that's all I think uh, Sumia wants to talk, of, wants to mention the um, reading marathons. Sumia, do you want to talk about that? I'll mention that. Where'd Sumia go? Is she still here? Your mic might be muted. Oh, she's still Sumia, here. Do you want me to explain? I, I'm, I'm... Oh, you know about it? Yeah, she says, she says there are over 200 teams taking part. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's three. So I, uh, from a teacher who was teaching at Kansa, Kindai, Kindai, I think, in Japan, went to Mongolia uh, 
part of the US State Department and he, he introduced teachers there to extensive reading. And this was a few years ago and I, I went to visit, I met a group that said they were interested. I, I was a little bit dubious and, you know, but nice chance to go to Mongolia. And it was such an amazing experience and they have established an incredible, absolutely incredible extensive reading program. I don't know if people are familiar with SEG, the, the uh, I guess it's a Juku up in Tokyo that emphasizes extensive reading. They basically created the same thing, but online. And they have thousands of students reading unbelievable amount of books. And they have some students who've read, I think almost every single book in X reading. It's really remarkable what they've done. And one of the things they've, uh, one of the ways they've done it is creating these reading marathons, which are just competitions. Um, and these are not students in one, necessarily in one school, they're in different schools, sometimes it's individuals, uh, company workers, uh, parents, whatever it is, and, and they are just crazy about reading. Um, I really hope that the, the, the group called Ling Lingors will present it in the, uh, in the next uh, ER Foundations conference or in, in Indonesia and share with the world how they've gotten people to read so much it's really remarkable and uh yeah i'm just i'm just i admire so much their work and i want to know the secret I, I do know that they do give nice prizes that's probably helpful and they do a lot of promotion they are i don't use facebook but i've been told that they are on facebook every hour promoting something mentioning something it's it's just great uh guys did i do a good job of explaining what you do was that reasonably accurate. Uh, did anybody want to add anything to that? Yes, thank you, Paul, for mentioning that in here. So we have been working and practicing ER in Mongolia since 2013, but officially as a distributor company since 2018, June, uh, we became distributor for the x reading library. So first, we didn't have a clue how to promote the x reading and we usually visit office buildings and companies and individual users, schools, any, any chance, we just grabbed the chance to promote the x -written. We usually talked about how to use x -written library and how to read the simple stories and actually the held the workshops in every possible places. But in 2019, we had the, we actually received two books as a gift from Paul and Thank you, Paul, for those books. Oh, please. Uh, Maybe this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we use the idea um, marathon. It's not actually running marathon, uh, you, not usual marathon. It's reading marathon. So people have set up goals in uh, on given time. For example, three weeks. Now ongoing marathon is uh, with last for three weeks. It started 17th of February and will finish around 8th of, oh no, 9th of March. So first week they have to read 20 books, uh, any given level on the over level, and then do grammar. They have to present their ideas uh, they learned from the book uh, using the Facebook huge group that's 26,000 members in one group. It's called Extensive Readers in Mongolia. So by teaching and presenting their uh, learning from particular story, they're actually teaching others and inspiring others to read more. So that written marathon was really the key event that we usually uh, held every month, every possible month. And we usually, yeah, it, it's just great. I can find the correct word. So people usually read a lot during the events and they keep reading. We have like one user, a boy from South Mongolia, uh, he read about 5 million words on x -reader. So that means the whole library. Yeah, I have to keep adding books for, uh, for my students in Mongolia. Yeah, really, really remarkable. Any, any other questions anybody has? Thank you, Sumia. Thank you. I, I hope you'll, uh, you guys will come to Japan or, or we'll all meet at the World Congress in Indonesia in uh, 2022. When these times are over, we will be there Great. for sure. Other Thank you. Questions? I, I see there's some in the chat, but I'm having trouble trying to access them.
something can, can I just make a comment, Paul and Mark? I mean, so you guys are in the extensive reading sick, right? Now, a lot of what you're doing, you know, so you're using graded readers with X reading, but a lot of it technically isn't extensive reading. Um, it's, it's kind of forced reading. And I don't see that as a bad thing. And this is kind of getting back to Tim's question is, um, so Jolt has an extensive reading SIG, but it doesn't have a reading SIG. And there's a whole bunch of other types of reading that are also good that students need to do. So some students aren't going to do extensive reading. They're not going to read hundreds of books just out of, you know, on their own. Mm -hmm. So we, we do forced reading, um, which is actually a good thing. You know, that's how most of my uh, friends at school learned to read when we were kids. That you know, the teachers forced them to read and they didn't like it. Okay. Um, so this idea that everything has to be extensive reading, you know, and, and graded readers are just for extensive reading, I, th I think is, is mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, you know, that's, I think, part of the answer to Tim is, you know, st students go to university to learn and part of that is reading and maybe they don't like doing it. The teacher has to, you know, compel them to do it. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's, that's what schools are for, right? Thanks. I, I would say is, you know, I created X reading with extensive reading in mind, but there are plenty of schools that are using it for pure intensive reading because it's, it's it, at the end of the day, it's just a huge library of graded of books that they can do whatever they want with. And yeah, in, in Taiwan in particular, they, they students in, in some universities, they just have the students read four books a year. And X reading is still financially advantageous for them because it's still cheaper than buying the books. Um, but you're right, it, it absolutely can. And from, from the X reading perspective, other teachers, may, other participants they may have other views on, on other points of your question. Stuart? Yeah, yeah sure, go ahead. Um, related to what Bill and then Trevor said, um, well, I think, Bill, you were saying that lots of people who promote or ask their students to read possibly are not reading themselves, yeah? In the L2. That was one of my impressions in trying to get people to read with me and trying to, like, mm. you know, do, do a bit of, like, our impression of how difficult it was or how easy it was or for us to do it. You know? I fully agree. So for most of us in Japan, if we were to stop like if I stopped trying to publish and I spent most of my time taking my N2 to N1, that would be the best thing for professional development. But the motivation isn't there. So we're asking our students to do something that us as teachers in Japan who are trying to get better jobs or move up tend not to do ourselves. So th this is where, while I agree with much of what Trevor said, I don't think asking students to do something and giving them marks for it means it doesn't, means it's not extensive reading. So I, I agree with Trevor. I think we need a, a reading SIG and we need to see that for balance purposes, extensive reading is a very important part of reading in general. But just because we ask students to do something doesn't mean it stops being extensive reading. And, and because of that, Waring and I published mm. a paper in 2015. And it, well, our, our, our view was maybe a bit controversial. So the editors were a bit unsure. So they said, okay, look, we'll publish your paper, but we're going to ask all these other people to give their points of view. And it turns out most of them agreed. We, we, we had this doctrine that you had, you had the Ten Commandments from... Uh, Day in Bamford, and if you didn't follow these 10 rules, you were kind of shouted at, at presentations. That's not extensive reading. But extensive reading comes down to we care about the cognitive process. Before, extensive reading was kind of defined on what was read and how it was selected. But if you're reading quickly, i.e., so it has to be pretty easy, and you're reading large amounts you're going through the cognitive processes necessary to develop your reading ability. 
And whether or not we're requiring a student to do it or we're giving them marks for it or not, that doesn't mean it can't be extensive reading. Other than that, I agree with everything Trevor said. <laughs> can, can I just add to um, um, to with Stuart, Stuart and, and Rob's definition of extensive reading, I think is very good. I have an even more simple definition of extensive reading is reading a lot. And I think for students or for anybody to become good at a language, they need, there's no magic. We spend lots of time trying to do research on is this effective or what's, it's time. And if they spend more time on the language, and if we spend more time in Japanese or in French or whatever, we will become better at the language through, through spending more time. So um, if they're going to spend, and the amount of time they're going to spend, reading is one way that they can spend time immersed in the language. And in for many people, it's the best way. So if they are going to spend a long, if they're going to read a lot, they need to read a lot if they're going to read. And if they are going to read a lot, yeah, of course, there's going to be different kinds of reading. But a lot of it is going to have to be fluent reading at high speed in order for them to get a lot of language in. So I think, I mean, the point of the extensive reading, the point of the extensive reading SIG is to promote extensive reading and promote people to read a lot. And we do have these discussions and there is a lot, there's a lot more to reading as well. Um, there, it would be great if there was a reading SIG um, because there's lots of research about reading, but I think it's all within the extensive reading. I think there's a lot, there's a lot of different ideas, but I think we need to, a lot is the, uh, is the, the key part of the, the word, I think. Okay, so we've gone a bit over time, so I, I think- Stuart, Stuart, Stuart had a follow-up question. Wrap it up. Okay, Stuart go ahead. Well, it's yeah. a story related to this kind of, def this old uh, definition of it, read it, um, extensive reading. When Rob and I submitted our paper, it was originally rejected by reading a foreign language. And, um, that they said, they said, you are overplaying the importance of the top 10 by Day and Bamford. It's, they are not rules. And I, I knew this was a load of rubbish because I've seen it come up in presentations, I've seen it in papers. So I just searched on the internet for a couple of minutes and just by chance, the Day's student who was also the assistant editor of reading on a foreign language, in his paper, he said, I didn't define the reading that students conducted as extensive reading because they were not in line with Day and Bamford's 10 rules. And then I just sent that back to them and they said, okay, you're right. We, we, we will now accept your paper. So there, there's this kind of, although it's not explicit, it's no, although it's not published, when you're, when you're reviewing or you're trying to get published, you see this stuff all the time. One reviewer will say that's not X reading. I mean, one one reviewer will say that's not extensive reading because it's not in line with Dan Bamford's rules. And, and we've got to stop this. We, we can't tell teachers they're doing something wrong because they do it slightly different to what ESL teachers teaching some of the best students about defined as extensive reading. Because many of us in EFL settings don't have students that motivated or that good. So, so, so as, as Rob would say, we need a kind of big tent definition that, that doesn't exclude people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's definitely needs. Uh, I think the main thing is students have to be reading a lot and reading easy. And other than that, yeah, there, there needs to be a lot of uh, room. All right, any other last questions from anyone? Shirley Scott, something there? Um, Grant yeah. wants to mention, oh, okay. or can, can Grant mention Pan Sig? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for let, giving me the opportunity. So everyone knows I've been kind of uh, promoting the Pan Sig. You can see on my screen, it's, the, it's May 15th and 16th, the weekend of. <clears throat> we were hoping to get to the wonderful place of Shizuoka and Mishima, but it looks like we're gonna be having another uh, virtual conference uh, via Eventzilla. The theme this year for the conference is local and global perspectives. 
plurilingualism and multilingualism. So it's going to be a great conference. We have two new SIGs, uh, by the way. Uh, so we have a total of 30 uh, SIGs uh, participating, uh, officially 29, uh, we're, but about 30 SIGs. We we're hoping to get everyone participating this year. So just, just down the road, um, we'll be opening up, uh, unfortunately, um, presentations is closed, but we will be opening up the events a little soon. And so you can go in there and register. When you do register, make sure if, if you're already into the system, use your the same email that you used before. Otherwise problems could, could happen. Great presentation today. And for everything you guys should thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to mention uh, the PANSA. Thank you. Shirley did want to say something, but uh, Shirley, you're on warning. It's, you're standing between us and beer. <laughs> Paul can answer in the chat. It'll be a quick, it's a quick question just for him. So yeah. not a thank you. Do we have to end things now or what's is there just as well? <laughs> we, we will formally end by uh, asking for a round of applause or a waved hand or something or other in the chat. There they are. Good. Thank you guys. Thanks very much for, for uh, coming along tonight and, and uh, presenting. And on that note, we uh, we end the formalities. We'll stop the recording button and we'll um, build. Uh, oh.